Joining us now is Professor Robert Winston, the one and only Professor of Science and Society at Imperial College London. It's so great to have you on, Robert. Thank you so much. Do you think the NHS is in need of critical reform or can we continue with the model as it is? Well, I'm not sure, of course, if I'm a serious adult, but I'll do my, I'll do my best to grow up between this conversation, if I may. <laughs> I, I think we've got a major problem here because the government, as you know, is producing this new bill to again reform the NHS. And they're doing it before, in fact, examining what's happened during the pandemic, which, of course, has been the most serious crisis or, or health problem since the NHS was formed in, in 1948. And I think, actually, they really are doing it the wrong way around. I really do think we do need to have an analysis of actually where we could have done much better with the pandemic and what went wrong, particularly with certain areas which really I think were fairly disgraceful. Uh, and I don't think, it's, you know, it's, it, you can blame whatever government you want. I don't think any of us would have got it right. But I think that is a real issue before you start then deciding how you're going to legislate. Then I think there are reforms. And of course, there are a number of things we do need to think about, some of the things that you're, you're no doubt suggesting, for example. Yeah, why is it that we can't seem to have a debate on this? We've never been able to have a debate on this, frankly. Every time someone might suggest, I think at one point you suggested perhaps people should pay for missed GP appointments and the, the, the cries of horror go up. Oh, this is, you know, start of a slippery slope to privatisation. Why can't we just talk about this thoroughly? Because at the end of the day, this is probably the most important service that anybody encounters. It's the first thing that you see when you're born. It's the last thing you see when you die. I agree. I think you're quite right about that. I think education probably is equal to it. But apart from education, the NHS must be the most important single thing for the taxpayer. I think the problem has been, particularly with the NHS, is that it's become, ever since 1948, a political football. The Labour Party claim it's theirs. The Tory Party say they can do it better. And of course, this results in people making ludicrous comments about the NHS. And of course, those statements have been going on throughout the pandemic on both sides. And I don't think that's very helpful. Um, and I think we need to be, first of all, the first thing we do need to, I think, decide is actually what does individual treatment care actually cost? The accounting in the health service is really very poor and different health authorities charge completely different amounts to the purchasers for a particular service, a particular operation, a particular piece of care. So accountancy is vital in any other industry. And this is our biggest industry. This would be something that would be absolutely vital to working out how much you do need to pay. And you can't decide really how you're going to pay or what way of paying until you've actually understood the cost of the treatments and the cost of having the service. That's a big problem. What, what do you see? I mean, you said during the um, pandemic, it exposed some utter disasters in the NHS. What are the areas that are really, really problematic? You know, if, if, if things about the operational system, the NHS were to keep you up at night, what are they? Well, I, look, should we start with social care? I mean, social care is the biggest issue. And of course, Lansley didn't really accommodate that at all in that bill. And that's been a big, big problem for the NHS. And of course, social care was also a disaster during the pandemic because, of course, all people we feel, some of us feel, died unnecessarily as a result of the pandemic getting into care homes. And it's very clear that there was not a joined up way of dealing with that. But I think in, in general, for example, one of the things the pandemic showed also was the lack of good pathological services because we've stopped centralizing a pathology. So actually, for example, PR, PCR test, testing was completely inadequate. A lot of those things are really a problem, I think. So in I, w I would argue also the other issue, which is a gener gen uh, generic issue, is that we are now very much an aging population. The, the democracy, demography of Britain has changed, and that means that as you get more old people, you have what is called multimorbidity. That means you end up with several different diseases. And unfortunately, the NHS is not, is not joined up. So if you have a heart disease, that's nothing to do with the kidney specialist. If you've got a kidney problem, it's not related to your diabetes necessarily. And of course, what we really need to do is, first of all, I think, to be much more clear about the need for care for old people. The government's promised that it would increase longevity in, in, by, by 2030. Actually, longevity in Britain is decreasing. That's a sign that the NHS is not working very well. 
if Lord Winston could be put in charge of the health service, and the question was asked of Lord Winston, would you countenance something like a hybrid insurance model? If we got to the stage now that having something fully state controlled, fully taxpayer funded is actually a behemoth that doesn't serve a, a growing and aging population in the 21st century, where you've got innovative new drug, drugs coming in on stream that perhaps have big price tags. Would, do you think that the actual fundamental model needs to be completely changed or discussed? Or is it just a case of a lack of funding for the model that we have? Well, you say changed, and you also say discussed in the same sentence. I think it needs, <laughs> a, a, I think it needs an adult discussion. And I think that debate has not happened. So, for example, uh, would it be seriously worthwhile considering a hypothecated tax where people understand how much of their taxation is going towards their health care? That might make a very big difference, indeed, indeed, how people treat the NHS. And then, of course, you know, some form of insurance system, which, of course, was not acceptable to the Labour Party uh, when Tony Blair was in power. I mean, certainly I discussed that with him and he said it just wouldn't be possible because the party wouldn't accept it. And I think that's probably still true. But actually, again, it comes back to the problem of the cost of care and the cost of drugs. And of course, what you can't do is to expect drug companies to drop their profits more than they can, than is desirable, because of course, drug development depends on shareholders investing in that money. And it takes 13 years to develop any new compound. We've been amazingly lucky with the vaccines, but that's been completely unusual. It's the first time that a drug has gone actually from the laboratory to the bedside or at least to the patient within within a year. That's never happened before. And it can't happen all the time because the investment, of course, as you saw, was absolutely massive. So I think I think I think it still comes down to the critical need to actually see what you have as a budget. And then of course you can start to see how you divide it up and whether you decide, for example, there are certain treatments that you're not going to provide. And of course at the moment the NHS does unofficially ration the healthcare. There are some people it won't treat because it's going to be too costly or because actually the disease is not actually a fatal disease. But we're not honest about it. We don't say, well, actually, we're not going to put you in intensive care uh, because it's too costly, because actually you're probably going to die anyway as a result of the virus, let's say. I mean, we're using the virus at the moment, but of course it applies to a whole range of different things. And I think that has to be really sorted out. I think there needs to be much more honesty. And as long as it's a political football, it's very, very difficult. But surely those things probably exist in the private sphere as well. If you have an insurer uh, backing up your medical costs, do they not operate on a system like we use the quality, don't we? The quality mm, of life mm, to mm. cost ratio, whether or not this drug that costs a million pounds will give someone who's young and healthy a longer time to live or someone, you know, only a few weeks if they if their prognosis was not as positive. Does that not exist in, in the private sector as well is that or, or is that something uniquely related to the fact that this is no, a state-funded institution the well the private sector is very expensive there's no question that in fact of course it has all sorts of extra expenses because it's the way it's buying its stuff in from the providers who are making the, the equipment or the or the things that they need and that's i think a big issue i mean i've, I've worked in America, and I've worked on the continent. I was, I was employed in Belgium for a while, so I've seen two different healthcare systems in some detail. I've also worked a bit in Australia. And I don't think the British system does badly in comparison. In fact, in America, I think, you know, it's probably more of a problem if you, if you go to the county hospital or whether you go to private practice. The standard of care that we now expect actually is one of the problems. We expect much better care than ever before because, in fact, we've got better medicine, better drugs, better technology. And therefore, we're losing the sight of the patient. I think that's also a problem as well in the health service. You know, we now talk about personalized medicine. But when we talk about personalized medicine, we look at our computer screen, at the results of the tests. We don't look at the patient's face and we don't talk or listen to the patient. So there is a kind of problem there as well. And, and, and I think... You know, of course, I know I am, you might think I'm rambling. Well, perhaps I probably am. <laughs> no, not I'm at trying, all. I'm fascinated. But, but, you know, I, I'm, I'm trying to see, you know, how, how you get through that, that morass of difficulty. And it's a problem for any government. Um, and certainly, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not sitting here as a, as a political figure in any kind of way. I want to see the best possible care that, 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 that's available. But at the moment, you know, we have a, you know, if you take the workforce, a huge number of people are leaving the workforce. People are retiring before the end of the workforce because they're, before their retirement age, because actually they're fed up with working with the NHS. And it's not that they've been paid that badly because many of the people who are retiring early have been paid quite well, but they actually don't feel they want to do 
deal with the bureaucracy anymore. There are some very good things in the NHS. For example, NHSX, which is the you know which is the new data um, uh, machine, I think is a real bone boon. I think it's going to be very well run. I think it's extremely promising. I think how we share data could make a massive difference to healthcare, but it's still too early to assess how well it will do. But of course, NHS X and or that kind of relationship could certainly be looked at looking at costing as well. And that also would be helpful for you if we could use data more wisely, um, not only just for the actual healthcare itself, but also for the things which require paying for healthcare. I think that would be a big plus. Maybe we'll do that because, you know, we have got that arm, that new arm in the NHS, which, you know, I think is very welcome. Well, it's very welcome to end on an optimistic note. Well, I could talk to you all day. I really could. You are a national treasure when it comes to the NHS. And having your input in this discussion has been an absolute pleasure. So Welcome to the GB News YouTube channel. You can watch us live 24 hours a day, catch up on your favourite shows and join in the conversation in the comments below. Don't forget to subscribe and you'll never miss any of our exclusive content.